I surely hope you are doing well, friends. Grace and peace to you. And of course, I have my refreshing beverage here, and I hope you do as well. Normally, I prefer, as you know, a carbonated, chemically laced, artificially sweetened one, but whatever you have, I just want you to be comfortable right here in Texas, in the Texas Gulf Coast, in Houston today, June. 10th, right? June, uh, June 10th, 2020. The temperature was 146 degrees. Yes. No, it was actually, the heat index was 110. 110. I'm recording this Tuesday for Wednesday, uh, June 10th. June 10th, heat index of 110. 10. Hopefully you were comfortable. Uh, this room, I've iced this room down to about 69 degrees. At the very end, if you stay after the fade, I'll tack on a short uh, time-lapse video of what I had to do to take down all the stuff that was set up for the other recordings that we have been doing during the uh, corona quarantine. We've used this room for recording the sermons and for other classes and devos and stuff that Corey has been doing. So that might be uh, fun for you to watch. I'll put that there at the end. All right, let's, uh, let's go. I've got to get, I've got to include, squeeze in here a couple of things that I left off last time. Uh, oh, got my timer. Yes, we are rolling. Huh? Huh? Um, First, though, I do want to mention where we have all this information available, all the stuff that you see on these slides, as, I, as I've said over and over, it's all available at the link that I'm including now. Underneath each YouTube video, you'll see in the description box, you'll see a link there. Now, you might have to click the little button on the right, the little down arrow to open up that box a little bit further for those of you who are maybe not as uh, technically uh, adept as others. I just uh, wanted to say that delicately, <clears throat> Miss Olivia. Um, but you see that link there, and when you go there, all these files are there. However, the latest ones, and by the time you see this, it should have number 24 up because we'll need 24 on with the additional material we're going to get to. But it only goes back to uh, 11 because I, I took down the files to adjust a few things on them, make them look a little bit different, and especially the thumbnails. And I haven't uploaded all of them again, so I need to do that. If, if by the time you're watching this, I have them all up there, well then good, you can see them all. But right now, uh, for the time being, they start at 11, and I will try to get the rest of those uploaded soon, Lord willing. So last time, I felt like there was something I left out. And sure enough, I went and listened to the class after I uploaded it to YouTube. I listened to it then later that day, and I knew there was something missing, and I found it. I recorded the class twice. I finished recording, and I wasn't happy with how it came out, and so I did it again, and I included this in the first recording, but in the second recording, the class that I kept and that was uploaded and that you saw, uh, I left it out. So here it is. Let me just put this information up there for you. But when we were talking about salvation, themes and theology in Luke's gospel under the heading of salvation, Luke stresses salvation. It has now arrived. The age of salvation is here and salvation is available for all people everywhere. That's an emphasis we see over and over in Luke Acts. But let me add these things to that point that uh, that these things that I left out. The sending out of the 70, there's the limited commission in Matthew 10. You find that in Matthew and Mark where Jesus sends out the 12, but only in Luke is there a second commission of the 70, and likely it's 70. That's a highly symbolic number, uh, of course, with seven and a multiple uh, multiplied by 10. 70 is uh, likely 
the number selected because in Genesis 10, where you have the table of nations, there are 70 names. And so that suggests all the peoples of the whole world. And some Bibles may say 72. I think the ESV, in fact, says 72. Jesus sent out 72 because some Greek manuscripts have 72. And that's probably because the Septuagint has 72 names listed in uh, Genesis 10. So there, there's a little bit of a, um, a difference there depending on your translation. But that uh, reinforces the point that we're making. There's a second invitation in the parable of the banquet in Luke chapter 14. And in the, in the parallel account in Matthew, you have the invitation goes out and others are brought in. But only in Luke do you find here, and I've got the text up there for us, and Notice it's only in Luke then that they come and say, well, uh, notice verse 22, uh, Sir, what you commanded has been done and there is still room. There's still room. So the master said, uh, well, go out, go out in the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. So there's a second invitation that's only in Luke's gospel. This idea, compel, pe compel people to come in. The Latin is compelle entrare, uh, compel to, uh, to come in. And that has been abused in church history, uh, incorrectly taken to mean that you can coerce people to become Christians or that you can use force, uh, you can use uh, violence. Um, and, and that obviously is contrary to New Testament teaching. I would hope that we would know that. The idea of compelling people to come in, it's just powerful language being used there to be persuasive and urgent to, um, to fill up the Lord's kingdom with, um, with all who will come in. It's, it's a great uh, second invitation that is only there in Luke's parable of the banquet. It's not uh, like jihad, where in jihad the, the world is to be converted to Islam and if necessary by force. No, no, there's no parallel to that at all in Christian teaching. Uh, despite the use of that compelle, uh, compelle entrare. All right, now Luke's genealogy, remember, unlike Matthew's. Matthew starts his gospel with the genealogy, and he starts with Abraham and goes to Jesus. Luke's is at the end, not at the very beginning of his gospel, but at the end of the birth narrative. He puts it on there uh, after the, the rest of the birth narrative, and he, rather than uh, ending with Jesus, like Matthew does, he starts with Jesus and goes all the way back, not to Abraham, but all the way back to Adam. And again, that is suggestive of God's concern, not just for Israel, for the people of Abraham, but all the people of all the world. So uh, when you look at all this information, and I know it's a little bit disconnected now because this was supposed to be uh, along with all the other material that I already presented on this, but uh, I wanted this thought to strike us that by fulfilling what God has promised to Abraham, to Israel, Jesus becomes the Savior of everyone, not just Israel. And that thought is, to some degree, in the other Gospels. What I'm trying to say here is that no one brings this out like Luke does. So, something we, I hope we showed um, sufficiently for you to see. All right, then under concern for the outsiders, Concern for the outsiders, I left this off at the bottom of this slide. Again, I knew as I was going through the class, there was something. I tried to think of it. There's a place where I pause, and I try to think of what it was. Well, I found it. Uh, I want to include here, when we're thinking about the, the references to the poor 
and that captures the concern reference to the poor for those who are oppressed, excluded, marginalized, disadvantaged. In the programmatic passage, that one of the key texts in Luke chapter 4, 17 through 21, Jesus says, uh, I've come, he's quoting from Isaiah 62, to bring uh, good news to the poor, to the poor, and recovering a sight to blind, of the blind, set at, set at liberty those that are bruised, etc. Uh, bringing this year of Jubilee, the age of Jubilee, the age of, of forgiveness of debts and restoration and joy and liberation and all of that, that's expressed as some, something that is good news for the poor, for the poor. So I left off that and also this, uh, a, a list of some other passages. That's when Jesus tells that to John in chapter 7, 22. Tell, Go tell John the poor have good tidings proclaimed to them. Uh, for example, 16 and verse 20, that's the where you have the uh, beggar, Lazarus. There you have a poor man. And um, you have places like uh, Zacchaeus in chapter 19 and verse 8 says, I'll give all that I have to the poor. Uh, Jesus tells the rich man, go sell all that you have, give to the poor. In uh, the book of Acts, Paul says um, about concern for the needy, it's better to, it's uh, more blessed to give than to receive. He, he says that's something that the Lord Jesus said. And I just wanted to make sure I got those passages included in there. So now we need to talk about women. We need to talk about women. When we're thinking about the concern for the outsiders that we have in Luke's gospel, I need to just continue now um, with what we've, what, what, to add to the categories we've already included. That, and this, as I mentioned at the very end of class, this could have been its own separate point. There's so much that could be said here just about this. But we see. Uh, the concern for the outsiders, the marginalized, and Luke's emphasis on women. And with Luke saying so much about women, it's, that's ex especially striking given the fact that women were generally relegated, as we have on the slide here, to a low status in the ancient world, just as it is today in places that are not shaped by where the cultural institutions have not been shaped by a biblical worldview. I mean, look at the places in the world where women suffer the most, where women are denied equal rights under the law, where they're denied even basic human, what we would think of as even basic human rights in Western culture, and, and where you find women languishing still, even in the modern era, even in this postmodern era, the places you find the most oppression of women is in those cultures where the gospel has not gone and shaped the development of those cultures like we have seen it in the West where women enjoy the uh, uh, equal rights under the law and the highest status that you see anywhere in the world, anywhere in history. So that's quite a claim I'm making there. I know we don't have time to go into it, but uh, think about how striking it is for Luke in the ancient world to say uh, so much in the first century about uh, women in his gospel. Women are featured more prominently in Luke than the other synoptics. And in particular, we see the role they played in Jesus' ministry is highlighted by Luke more than any other gospel. So let me, let's go through some examples here. In the birth narrative, what do we find? We find Mary, right at the start of Luke's gospel. Mary, Elizabeth, Anna. Look at all these wi women that Luke brings onto the stage in his narrative right from the start. As you continue in his gospel, again, unique to Luke's gospel is where Jesus raises the son of the widow of Nain. Also unique, I think one of the most powerful stories in all of the Gospels, the woman, the sinful woman, Luke calls her a sinner, and that maybe there is evidence to suggest that Luke's reference to a sinner in that way uh, could be that she was a sex slave. 
that she was like what we call uh, trafficking today, sex trafficking of uh, girls and boys. Uh, it's tragic to think of how uh, girls and, and, and young boys and women are forced into sexual slavery. Well, that was a reality in the first century and in the ancient world, and unfortunately still is in our world today. But when she, this woman anointed uh, Jesus in the house of Simon the Pharisee and wet his feet with her tears and wiped his feet with her hair. And the Lord teaches a powerful lesson about forgiveness and love. It's just a beautiful text. I know I've been overusing that word beautiful lately when I've gone back and listened to the classes, but that's unique to Luke's gospel, the story of uh, Jesus in the home of Mary and Martha in chapter 10. Um, that's, a, uh, that's interesting because there you have Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Listen, you've got Mary sitting at Jesus' feet there. And this in a time, I've got that in very small text. It's nearly impossible to read. I'm sure it's impossible to read if I blow it up like this. You might be able to see it. But this is this in a time when rabbis debated whether women, whether it was appropriate at all for women to learn the Torah. I mean, that was a matter of debate. That wasn't something that was agreed upon that, yes, it's, a, it's good and right for women to learn the Torah. It, it wasn't even uh, universally accepted that women should learn the law. So there, that's a great story where Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and he's teaching her. And there are parables unique to Luke's gospel that feature women like in chapter 15, verses 8 through 10, you know, the woman who sweeps looking for the lost coin. And then in chapter 18, 2 through 5, the, you have the persistent widow and the unrighteous judge. So that's interesting to include in the list as well. All right, let's go on. So only Luke tells us of these women who were supporting Jesus' ministry with their means. Now, uh, this is quite striking because he names several of those who were following him. In chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, he mentions Joanna and Susanna. He heals a woman, and this is a striking uh, account of in my mind, there are several striking statements that are made in connection with Jesus' healing of this woman who was bent over and had a disabling spirit. And she, Jesus says, I believe it's in verse 16 of chapter 13, that Satan had bound her all these years. And he refers to her very, delic uh, very delicately as a daughter of Abraham, a lovely expression there as Jesus talks about her. And notice then also the poor widow who puts her two coins, her, her two coins into the collection. Now, that is in Mark, but interestingly, Matthew doesn't include it in his gospel. But Luke wants to keep that in his. So it's one of the rare, rare uh, instances where you have. Luke, including something from Mark that Matthew leaves off. And back when we were looking at the, the comparing the synoptics, we, we explained that that was uh, very uncommon. So that, that's one of those. So notice this, that Luke frequently parallels stories involving men with ones that feature women. <laughs> so you might think of Luke maybe as the uh, first writer in history who uh, ha uses inclusive references or in inclusive language, sort of, because if he's going to have some, some story about a man or some reference to a man, then he'll, he'll also make sure to include some parallel account about a woman. And in that document that I gave you with all that information on Luke, it's on page 10 of that document, where we show the special emphasis on women in the Gospel of Luke, where he has these parallel stories. Uh, he has these parallel stories about women. And there's a list, the first list 
that I included there was from Garland in his commentary on Luke in the Zondervan exe uh, exegetical commentary on the New Testament series. But I prefer the material that follows that actually, and that material is from Powell in the Fortress Publications work, uh, his work, Introduction to the Gospels. Powell, I referred to him as one of my sources when I gave you the sources for Matthew, and he has great stuff on Luke as well. But I like, if you look at that document, then you'll see, you'll see his parallels, I think, are a little bit better and they're clearer and because they are not as easy to see if you're watching on the video since I don't have people here in class I realized uh, in class it's a lot easier to see the smaller text than when you're watching on a small device on a phone or tablet so I, I wrote these a little bit larger and look at some of these examples male female parallels in Luke well, you have the Annunciation to Zechariah, but that's paralleled with, oh, there's also one to a woman, to Mary. The Song of Zechariah, but you also have the Song of Mary. There's a prophecy of Simeon in, uh, in whoops, yeah, in chapter 2. But then there's also the uh, prophecy of Anna. So, in other words, it's you seeing women, if I can say it this way, getting, uh, getting equal time. Simon prophecy and I'm trying to get my writing tool here. The man from Syria, the woman from Sidon. Uh, the uh, sorry, I'm stuck. My document's stuck. There we go. The uh, demon is rebuked in the in the man, but then there's an account of a fever that's rebuked in the woman. The, uh, there's a desperate man forgiven, but then the, that account in chapter 7 we showed, there's a desperate woman forgiven. List of male disciples, right? But only Luke has that list of female disciples that includes Joanna and Susanna that we mentioned a moment ago. And the manservant saved from death, but then we have uh, something unique to Luke. The widow's son is saved from death. The man of Nineveh with the queen of the south. The man with the mustard seed. But then there's also the woman with the yeast. Uh, man is healed on the Sabbath. But there's a woman healed on the Sabbath. Again, an L passage. Man loses a sheep. Woman loses a coin. Two men asleep. Two women at the mill. Uh, but that's similar uh, language to what you find in, in Matthew. But... Interesting. Also, the women at the cross and who are, who are watching when Jesus is crucified and they're watching at the burial, but you also find references to that in Matthew and Mark, so that's not as strong of a point here for this unique theme and theology in Luke's gospel. I just wanted to list it, though. Women are first to the tomb, and they're the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection, once more, that's also true in the other Gospels. But then when you go to the book of Acts, Luke notes at the beginning of Acts that there were the women and Mary, the mother of the Lord. They're among the 120 who are in the upper room. And also, uh, women are, whoops, I'm having trouble here. Women are included among those who receive miraculous power from the Holy Spirit, that prophecy from Joel that I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters. Oh, that's something that we find where? In Luke, in uh, Luke's writings, in Luke Acts. The raising, we continue in Acts, the raising of Tabitha. Um, or Dorcas in chapter 9. And then when you continue, you look at Paul's missionary journeys, Luke mentions the women at a prayer meeting in Philippi and talks about Lydia. She is a businesswoman. And he tells us about Lydia's conversion. When he talks about Paul on the Areopagus in Acts 17, 34, there's a woman. They, they mocked and they cut him off and they weren't interested in hearing what he had to say. But there was, Luke mentions, Demaris as one who believed there. So I hope that she became a faithful disciple. Demaris, he mentions a woman there. Now, ah, watch this. Priscilla is mentioned with her husband. Priscilla and Aquila and Corinth in chapter 18, 1 and 2. And 
when they take Apollos aside, the text says, to teach him the way of the Lord more accurately, she is listed first. Her name is listed. It's Priscilla and, uh, I've said it, Aquila. Um, Priscilla and Aquila, she, her name comes first. And that might not sound like a big deal, except Luke, in Luke, the order of names is significant. I've listed several passages here. Again, I know you can't see those, but you can get the document by going to the link below. But in, you'll see in the way that he uses Paul's name with reference to Barnabas and with Silas, you'll see a subtle distinction where he changes the order of the names depending on who the dominant character is. And so, aha, that suggests to us when you understand that pattern in Luke's writing that when he lists Priscilla first with her husband, that suggests she's taking the lead in teaching Apollos. Now, she's not preaching publicly, and this is not in a worship assembly. They're talking to him. In a, in a private setting, and she takes the lead. Isn't that striking that he mentions Priscilla in, in that way? Then when we get to chapter 21, he tells us that Philip has four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. They prophesied. And so when you look at all this together, it's just striking to see that these women that Luke is so highly affirming of, they, they don't have a sense of entitlement. They respond humbly to God's grace. And it's God who takes the initiative to bless and use these women. And Luke is so highly affirming of the way the Lord uses pious, faithful women that they play a significant part in God's work. And as I said, they respond humility to, humi uh, with humility, humbly, with humility to the grace of God, using their gifts for the glory of God. I mean, when you think of their humility, think of Elizabeth when Mary comes to her in Luke 1, And this is a point I heard um, that I heard uh, Bach make, who is probably the leading Lucan scholar, one of the great scholars on Luke. And uh, he says... Uh, he, he points out how when Mary comes to Elizabeth, Luke 1, and she says, Who am I? Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Uh, I love how the birth narrative has so much that sets the stage for the things that Luke wants to tell us throughout his writings, all the way through his gospel and the book of Acts. And that's um, something that is a, a great point for us to emphasize today because before I get to that final point here, you know, many times people think that, that Christians who take the Bible seriously, that we have an ethic, we have a view of women that is degrading and that um, is sexist, that there's this misogynistic view that the Bible is very patriarchal and that women are, uh, because women have to be in subjection to their husbands and that women aren't allowed to be uh, elders who oversee the church or publicly proclaim the word of God. We have these limitations on the, on the role of women. We have women being used in different roles. But as I said earlier, it's wherever the gospel has gone that we see uh, women, the elevation of the treatment of women. And if we really look carefully at the ancient context, and especially now in the first century, and you look in history and you see the way women were treated at that time in that part of the world, it is extraordinary to find Luke uh, emphasizing women in, in that way. And so this is a good way to respond to people who think that that the Bible and even the New Testament portrays women in a negative light or that women are somehow excluded or inferior. Well, bring to mind Luke and his special emphasis on these good and godly women that he wants to make sure to include. So when we think about all that's said about the outsiders that Luke's concern in Luke Acts, how he shows us the concern of Jesus for the outsiders. What kind of summary 
emphasis or lesson can we take from this? What's the, what's the theology of it? Well, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that we show that God and our hearts and our lives are in line with the will of God is when we, like Jesus, it, like Luke shows us about Jesus, when we have this concern for those who are normally overlooked by society, who tend to be pushed to the margins, uh, we, if we are aware of those people and are sensitive of them and we're engaged and ministering compassionately and striving to include them and to include all, uh, that shows that our hearts are in line with the will of God. And, of course, that shows as well that every single person matters to Christ. That's a powerful point uh, about Luke's emphasis on Jesus' concern for the marginalized and the oppressed and the the disadvantaged, um, that Jesus came to minister and show love to, to all people of every race, of every social status. You remember the Samaritans we mentioned uh, and, and the, how the Gentiles are included. So, you, you, you know, right now there's a lot of racial unrest and concern about racism in modern American culture in the, in the wake of the, the George Floyd murder by a police officer in Minneapolis. And in fact, his funeral was today, Tuesday. Uh, the class is, is uploaded on Wednesday for our normal Wednesday Bible class, but the funeral was here in Houston today. And the answer to this racial unrest is ultimately the gospel of Jesus Christ the concern for people of all race, of every social status, of every gender and every position. There are only two genders, okay? When I say every gender, I just mean of both men and women, all right? I just need to clarify that. Uh, and the church is to be the means whereby the Lord continues to show that every person matters to Him. It's in the church as we live out the gospel of Christ and as we proclaim the gospel of Christ and as we minister to those in our community, it's through the church that people should see that every single person matters to God. All right, there's a lot more that we could, we could say about that, but let's move on to number eight in our list of themes and theology from Luke's gospel, the theme of reversal. And to do this... I have to change files. So I have to exit here. I'm going to close without saving changes and open uh, another, the next file. This will be, um, I'll need to upload the next set of boards here for everyone in the class. And these will be number 24. All right, and it takes just a moment. So this is a good time for you to... Um, Put it on pause and refill your snack bowl with your peanut M&Ms. Ah, okay. This theme of reversal. Now, I wanted to call it uh, the theme of radical reversal, but then I was wondering, well, isn't that isn't that redundant to think of um, a radical reversal? Because isn't isn't a reversal isn't that of itself radical uh, but what I mean is if we were to think of it as a rad theme of radical reversal maybe it doesn't hurt to have a redundant expression just for the sake of emphasis what I mean is that he talks about in this gospel he shows not just a radical change in condition but complete reversal it's more than just a change of conditions that the gospel brings, but it is actual reversal. That's the idea I'm trying to get across. Okay, so think of this. Now I'm calling it this shocking reversal as the heading for these slides under this, this uh, theme here. Now, all three gospels have the statement, the first shall be last, the, the last shall be first. You find that rather 
in uh, all three synoptics, right? This is a shocking reversal in Luke uh, in comparison to the other synoptics, okay? So, well, sure, you find that stated that the first are going to be last. See, that's a completely reversal, right? That the first will be last and the last will be first. Ah, but what else do we find that is unique to Luke, all right? Well, let's look at some things that you will find in Luke and only in Luke. And I want to make sure I'm not, yeah, I'm leaving this out. I'm leaving out a very important point. While all three Gospels have the first shall be last and the last shall be first, what I'm trying to say is the theme of reversal, though, is a hallmark of Luke Acts. So in other words, it's not just mentioned, but it is highlighted, it is brought to the, to the front with uh, great emphasis. So how does, how does Luke's Gospel begin, if we want to see that? All right. We, we go to the birth narrative once more, and I keep saying this, I know, but we're seeing over and over and over again how the birth narrative in Luke sets us up for all the major themes and all the emphases that we find uh, in Luke Acts. But notice, the Lord, Lord does not appear when He now uh, finally ends the centuries of silence and he interrupts history and he appears to set in motion the, the events that will bring Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one into the world. He doesn't appear to some rich or powerful ruler or to those who are privileged, but he appears to whom? To um, people of a humble station in life. See, this was supposed to be more dramatic because... Uh, when I practiced this earlier, see, all of this is supposed to be like this, see? So it's supposed to be, he doesn't appear to the rich and the powerful and the privileged, but, and then I slide this in, to people of a humble station in life. Like whom? Well, Mary, right? And he appears to the shepherds, and there are no magi coming, bringing uh, expensive gifts. No, to the lowly shepherds watching their sheep at night. And then Mary gives us the, uh, the Magnificat, right? And in the Magnificat, what does she say? What does she say? Look at it. Watch it. Wait. See, I've got to scroll back down. Uh, and Luke 1, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, verse 46. Now, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He's looked on the humble estate where did I get that blue from? The humble estate of his servant. For behold, she says, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Here, he has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty. This is this idea of reversal brought down the mighty from their thrones, but he's exalted those of humble estate. He's bringing down the mighty and he's bringing up. See, that's, what, that, that's what's happening with the age of salvation bursting onto the scene now. Christ ushering in the kingdom of God in the age of salvation. You're seeing uh, an equalizing and even a reversal where those who were of humble estate and who are thought to be nothing, are being elevated. And uh, the mighty, in a sense, then are being brought down. And notice, uh, he's filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he sent away empty. So normally we'd think of the, uh, we would think of the hungry as being empty, but it's the hungry who have the good things and the rich who are empty. So that, that theme of reversal is strong in the Magnificat. All right, now we find it in some other texts, and some of these I'll refer to on slides, but I'll just mention chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. I'll just mention some of the others. Here in the context, uh, this is with the parable of the unjust steward, and then Jesus talks about money and says, uh, you, can't, you can't love God and money. And they scoffed at that. The Pharisees scoffed at that. And so in, uh, in, whoops, in Luke chapter 16, then in verse 14, the Pharisees, Luke says, who were, who were lovers of money, 
Uh, well, they, they ridiculed that when they heard him say these things, they ridiculed to him these things. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Look at that. What is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So the things that men think of as exalted, it's exactly the opposite in the sight of God. So that hint, that touches on this theme. It hints at it, this theme of reversal. Well, what, what, where are we seeing reversal? Well, look how it's demonstrated in the parable of the wedding feast. This is where Jesus talks about inviting the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame and uh, rather than those who are of high estate and who could return the favor and, and uh, et cetera. And I don't, I don't think I included that. But yes, when you're invited, he says, uh, 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 wait, forgive me. And then in chapter 14 and verses 12 through 14, yes, that, that was what I wanted to do. Forgive me, forgive me. I don't want to go back and re-record the class because I botched this here. <laughs> All right, so forgive me. Um, all right, chapter 14, 7 through 11, uh, I was actually describing the parable of the great banquet here. Let's look at the text in chapter 14, 7 through 11. Sorry, I made that so confusifying. And if you were confusified, please forgive me. All right, chapter 14, 7 through 11 is the, is a par the parable of the wedding feast. Now watch this. I'm really stumbling all over myself tonight. Forgive me. It is 1.36 a.m., so I should be in bed, right? But uh, notice he says, when you're invited, um, he says, don't, don't sit at the most prominent or exalted seat and then somebody more important comes along and you get humiliated and get lowered. You get taken out to, and, and sat in the back in, in the uh, less important seat. So he says in verse 10, instead, when you're invited, go sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table instead of humiliated. But here's the point, and this statement's only in Luke, and that's why I wanted to include it. Here is the point. He says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Again, that idea of exactly the opposite happening, the reverse happening. And in the parable of the great banquet, that's where Jesus says invite, and I have, even have it right here, the poor, the blind, the crippled, the lame, and as well in the great banquet that follows that. You'll see that idea. But you see this uh, as well with the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, they both go down the temple to pray, and everyone would think of the Pharisee as being the one who would be justified uh, because he's so holy and so righteous. At least that's how people w would have thought. And the tax collector, the lowly, despised tax collector, he would have been regarded with contempt. But because he humbled himself before God, remember we said the, the outsiders in Luke's gospel are really those, wh whomever they may be, um, who will humble themselves before God. And in verse 14, we're told he's the one who went to his house justified rather than the other. And so there again, the idea of what is unexpected, the exact opposite. Now go to the account of the Beatitudes in Luke's gospel in chapter 6, in verse, verses 20 through 26. This is a part of the Sermon on the Plain that's in chapter 6, verses 20 through 49, and many equate this with the Sermon on the Mountain from Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Well, here he includes the Beatitudes that we find in the Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew chapter 5, but his are worded differently as we pointed out several times, and his have corresponding woes that accompany them. So we really need to look at it here be, to see this theme of reversal, how powerfully it's presented to us here. Look, he lifted up his eyes on the disciples. He said, blessed are you who are poor. Remember, not poor in spirit, just you who are poor. You who one of the you who's of scripture. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you uh, who are hungry, 
who are hungry now, you'll be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you're, you're going to laugh. See, there's going to be a reversal. You're hungry. Now, Jesus does say in Matthew's account of the Beatitudes, those who are, are hungry will be filled. But here he's saying, look, you're going to be satisfied. And if you weep now, you're going to laugh later. If you're persecuted now, you can uh, leap for joy and all of that that we have uh, pointed out before. But then when you get to the corresponding woes, he says, but woe to you, down in verse 24, woe to you who are rich, for you've received your consolation. In other words, that's all you have uh, is, is your money and, and don't expect anything more as, as far as uh, spiritually speaking. But then woe to you who are full now, for you're going to be hungry. See, those who are hungry are going to be filled. And those of you who are full now, you're going to be hungry. So woe to you who are full now, you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, you're going to mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so did their fathers of the false prophets. Uh, that's a passage that we often hear. Woe when all speak well of you. All right, theme of reversal. Uh, but let me say that theme of reversal is seen most powerfully and dramatically in Luke's gospel in the story. What would it be? Which account would show this? Think about it. What's unique to Luke's gospel that dramatically portrays a, a really shocking reversal? The account of the rich man and Lazarus, right? The rich man and Lazarus. Let's look at it. I'm trying to see what we have time to look at. Or I need to go quickly through this. So uh, notice some of these contrasts, and you may be familiar with it. I uh, really should just list this, but I can't help but look at a couple of references here. So he mentions the rich man. He's clothed, and look at, look at how, um, how vividly he portrays the story. The rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen. He feasted sumptuously every day. And then here you had this poor, pitiful beggar, Lazarus, covered with sores. All he wanted were the, the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. But you couldn't have more of a uh, dramatic disparity in condition than this rich man in view of this poor beggar at his gate who's living so high and luxuriously and so pitiful. And then that completely reverses, doesn't it? That completely reverses because the poor man died in verse 22. He's carried away um, to the, I'm sorry, to the bosom of Abraham. And verse 23, uh, to Abraham's side, the ESV says, the rich man also died and was buried in verse 23. In Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. He's in torment. And when he cries out for relief, Notice how Abraham emphasizes the change. He said, child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in lifetime bad things. But now, see, but now there's been a reversal, right? Now he's comforted here, and you're the one suffering. He's the one enjoying great comfort. You're the one now in anguish. So this idea of this Great reversal. There's a, there's a great day coming. And there is going to be this uh, dramatic reversal of condition for so many. And that is brought out in really a powerful way in Luke's gospel. So what is that telling us? What, is, what can we draw from that? The theology of Luke's shocking reversal, I'm wording it this way. It shows us that God's reign, that God's kingdom, it brings a great reversal of fortune. And an ultimate, ultimately, there will be a setting right of injustice. There will be an ultimate setting right of social injustice. That's the big concern right now in our day, social justice. Of course, different people define it different ways, and it makes a big difference what we're talking about. A lot of times people want to equate a certain social justice agenda with the Bible when they have in mind something that's quite foreign to the biblical concept of uh, justice. But notice, though, that one day God is going to 
bring justice. And it's supposed to be modeled now. It's supposed to be already beginning now with the gospel and the age of salvation. And it should be reflected in the character of Jesus' disciples and demonstrated by the church. But it's ultimately going to be realized. We should strive for it in the culture, in every way that we can bring it about, in every right and righteous means by which we can bring it about. But we know it will not be fully realized ever in this world, but one day, you see, we're, we're getting this emphasis in Luke's gospel that there's going to be everything set right and there'll be this great reversal. Now, the class is at, is a, at about 49, 50, 51 minutes or so. I'd like to try to squeeze this in since I don't have a bell ringing and I don't have a classroom full of people that, that need to go. And since you can watch it at a faster speed, uh, I'm going to just try to squeeze in this point that's very interesting. Ah, very interesting. I'm always saying that right. What is referred to as Lucan generosity. At least we can start it for a couple of minutes. Let me see. Can we finish it? Oh, I put all these slides in here. Uh, well, let's, let's see what we can do. Maybe I'll just rush through a little bit of this. Luke and generosity. I have it in quotes there, but that's a, that's a great way to refer to it. And much of what uh, I'm including here was suggested by Powell. It was some, some of the material you find in Powell's work, Introduction to the Gospel. But it really struck me here. Uh, when you go to Luke Acts... It, this is what we mean by Luke and generosity. In both Luke and Acts, Luke seems unusually generous in his portrayal of both the disciples and others. And so he seems intent on depicting almost all people in the best possible light. He wants to depict almost all people, not just the most pitiful and pitiable, not just the social outcasts, not just uh, women and other categories of people that were often overlooked or despised like tax collectors or, or the poor and the lame, the crippled. But he really strives to show all people in the best possible light. Let's just start with the disciples here, and I can list some things and rush through these. But first of all, consider, consider the disciples. Now, we've often pointed out that Mark is the one who portrays the disciples in the most negative light. When you go to Luke, he does have some negative things to say about the disciples. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these here. I just have a list here just to show that he also shows the disciples arguing over who's the greatest. Uh, Jesus rebukes them on occasion. You find some failures there uh, that are listed. He still tells us about Peter's denial. And so it's not as though Luke is just glossing over or excluding altogether uh, any faults on the part of the disciples. Um, however, however, here are some things you'll find that are unique to Luke's gospel. Six times in Luke, the twelve are already called apostles. And I say that's unique to his gospel, that the twelve are called apostles. That, that only happens once in Matthew. It happens twice in Mark, six times. And that's likely because he knows that these men are in the, in the rest of his story that he's going to tell in Acts. These men are going to play such a crucial role. And so they're apostles in training. And so he, uh, knowing what he's going to record in Acts, is already frequently uh, having Jesus refer to them and referring to them as apostles. He omits a statement about the disciples' lack of faith when... Jesus healed the boy with the seizures. You can compare that account in Luke 9 with Matthew. Also, uh, twice, Luke explains when the disciples fail to grasp Jesus' prediction about his suffering and death in Jerusalem. You do find that they don't understand it in Mark. And in Mark, 
were told they just didn't get it. They just didn't understand it. But in Luke, twice, Luke sort of excuses them by saying, well, they didn't get it because it was concealed from them. So in some way, Luke's saying it, it sort of wasn't their fault. It's almost as though he's mitigating it by saying, well, they didn't understand it, yeah, because it was concealed from them. So notice those two references from chapter 9, 21 and 22, and chapter 18 and verse 34. And that's very interesting that Luke several times talks about th pe people being, uh, things being concealed from people and revealed to people depending on what the Lord does. Like in the walk to Emmaus with the two disciples in Luke 24, verse 16, they didn't recognize him because he, it was he was concealed from them. His identity was somehow concealed from them. And then he reveals it to them in the breaking of the bread in verse 31. It was revealed to them somehow. And then in verse 45, very important text. You see that I've got it uh, in bold and in red there. But in Luke 24, 45, Jesus opens their mind to understand the scripture. So that's interesting um, about the other references of concealment and revealing by the Lord. Luke omits when um, Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus talks about it. He has to go to Jerusalem and be rejected and, and crucified. Luke omits Jesus saying, no, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then Jesus rebuking uh, Peter for, for his refusal to accept that. You don't find that at all in Luke's gospel as it is there in Mark chapter 8. And math, that's included in Matthew. Luke leaves Luke leaves that off, Peter's uh, ill-conceived um, plan, you know, ill-conceived intention not to allow Jesus to suffer in Jerusalem and then and his being rebuked. And Luke omits Mark's reference to the disciples being scattered when Jesus was arrested. You find it in Mark and also in Matthew. Luke leaves that off. And even though Luke does include the prediction that Jesus makes of Peter's denial. Uh, Luke alone, though, shows in Luke 22, 31 and 32, one of my favorite passages in, the, in Luke's gospel, where Jesus prays, tells Peter, I've prayed for you, though, that your faith won't fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brother. So only Luke includes, though all the Gospels record Peter's denials, only Luke tells us that Jesus says, well, Peter, I I've prayed for you so your faith won't fail and you're going to turn again and I'm going to use you. I want you to strengthen your brothers. That's, so that's a much more positive addition. It gives a much more positive um, perspective on Peter's denials and how Jesus viewed them and encouraged Peter in light, of, in light of that. So only in Luke, right? Only in Luke. Well, what about others? We've got just a couple of minutes here. Non-disciples, I'm, I'm using that term. Well, remember that Luke traces genealogy, uh, Jesus' genealogy, all the way back to Adam. And that seems to suggest the brotherhood of all, that Jesus is a brother to all, to us all, right? He, his lineage traces all the way back to Adam, and so does mine, and so does yours. And so we're all brothers. It suggests sort of a general brotherhood of man because we're all children of God. We're all children of the one whom Jesus calls his father, all right? Now you can contrast with Matthew's gospel. Matthew has a very harsh depiction of the Jewish leaders. Uh, in, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew presents them as wicked and ir irredeemably irre irredeemably wicked. They're like the offspring of the devil. Look at Matthew 23. Now there's a little bit, there are a few, a few clips, a few excerpts from Jesus' severe denunciation of the scribes and the Pharisees of the Jewish leaders in Matthew 23, but the other gospels don't, don't have that full text where Jesus excoriates them. Luke does pre present the Jewish leaders, as flawed. He does mention at times that they're, they're self-righteous, they're greedy, that they are opponents, ideological opponents of Jesus. They do debate him intensely on occasion. Yes, you do find that still in Luke, but, however, this is what we, we want to keep in mind, but he portrays them, this is 
the point, please, please take this with you. He portrays them still, despite as a, as a class of people. He does say that, Luke does say, they were opponents of Jesus. And they were lovers of money. They were self-righteous. Still, still, in Luke's gospel, even these leaders, even these men were considered by Jesus as worthy of his concern. And that, that challenges me. I hope it challenges you. Jesus still gives them his time and attention. See, he still, uh, look at Jesus and the Jewish leaders in Luke. Uh, even though he is harsh to them at times, he still will go in and dine with them on several occasions that I've listed there. He does attempt to teach them on correction. I'm going to just list those passages there. Uh, cor and he corrects them or encourages them as he would his own disciples. Wow, are, are there any classes of people? Or do we look around maybe and see on occasion some whom we might tend to think of as opponents of Christianity and maybe unworthy of our attention, of our consideration, or maybe they're just not interested in the gospel, and so we think that um, there's no need to show any concern. Well, we need to end there, but uh, we need to keep in mind this very powerful point from, I know I keep using some of these words over and over, interesting, beautiful, powerful, but that's what comes to my mind when I see something like this. When I see how even people who normally maybe we would think of as typically, typically being the kind of people that wouldn't be good prospects for the gospel, who, whom we could just overlook and dismiss. No, e even those kind of people, Jesus says, they're worthy of our concern. And we should be willing to give anyone our time and attention. Uh, think of maybe some people in your circle of influence or think of some categories of people. Maybe sometimes we think of the pe people that are extremely wealthy or of a very, very uh, high social class or with a lot of power or privilege. Um, maybe we might think of um, people who are in certain positions um, that traditionally d don't show an interest in the gospel. You know, some of the academic elite in our culture are some of the, the, the ones who are most hostile to what you and I hold dear, what Christians stand for and what we believe. Or right now there's a lot of concern about the abuse of police power and there's a concern over police brutality. Um, and uh, maybe there are times when we think uh, people in authority like the police would be hostile uh, toward us, you know, or uh, maybe unrighteous in some way. Well, it's unfortunate that there's a lot of judgment going on in our culture right now of people on, on the other side of issues and concerns that we have. But whatever kinds of debates are taking place in the social context and whatever categories or classes of people, wherever people are falling down uh, on this side or that side of the discussion, still, no matter who they are, no matter what their position is, no matter what we think they might think. When we look at Luke's gospel, when we look at the way Jesus is portrayed there and what Luke tells us about Jesus, uh, we need to understand that like the Lord, uh, everyone should be worthy of our concern, of our, of our time, and of our, our attention. May the Lord help us to do that. And may the Lord bless and keep you. 
and Lord willing, we'll be together again soon, or at least we'll be together this way through, through this, uh, this means of uh, sharing the gospel and teaching the Word of God. I'm glad we have YouTube. I'm glad we have this technology so that we can at least engage in this way. God bless you. Sometimes I just, you just have to leave or I'm never going to stop. You just have to turn it off. I'm just going to keep talking and just on and on and on. It just never ends. Tyler will not stop. When is he going to stop?